Hey everyone, welcome to Journey Church Online. Glad you're with us today. My name is Mark and I'm gonna be the online host for church today. We're glad you guys have joined us and happy 4th of July. It's a holiday weekend and hopefully you've got some uh, fun things planned. Maybe you're gonna grill out or you're doing some camping or hang out with family and friends. Whatever you've got planned, I hope you have a great time and have some fun celebrating this weekend. But we're also glad that you've joined us right now for our church service online. And Really glad you guys have joined us for that. I wanna encourage you to check out our blog as well. And there you'll find the online connect card, but also some next step opportunities for the whole month of July. If you are here in West Michigan, I wanna encourage you maybe to think about some in-person options. Uh, one of them is in July, we're gonna be doing one service at each of our locations on the lawn. And so you maybe wanna come check it out in an in-person service at each of our locations, just bring a lawn chair and hang out with us. Or maybe you wanna participate in some network hangout things we have going on. Or later this month, we're gonna be doing baptisms. And baptism is a great step to take in your relationship with Jesus if you're a follower of his. So all those details are on the blog and I encourage you to check out one of those options this month. Also want to say thanks for giving to The Journey. If um, you want to be a part of that, make sure you check out the giving options on our website. But as I said, today is the 4th of July and it's kind of a, a fun celebratory weekend, but you know, we also want to take time just to remember what this, um, this holiday is all about. And we take time to remember and to celebrate the, the freedoms that we have in this country. And you know, we all know the, our country, we'd say it, it's a great country, but we also know there's probably some things that aren't so great. Like we know our country is not perfect, but we do have a lot of privileges and freedoms that a lot of other countries don't have. So I just wanna take a, a moment today just to thank God for that, the, for the country we live in and, and to pray for our nation. So let's do that together. God, uh, in this holiday weekend, 4th of July, we just pause to, to not only just to celebrate, but to thank you for where we live and and some of the privileges and freedoms that we have, and one of them is to, to do this right now, to even have this church service online and have this freedom to worship you. We're, we're thankful for that. And we just pray for our leaders and for our nation that, that, um, that we would be a nation that's united and, and, and focuses in on you as, as the leader of, of who we are and, and that we can depend on you. Help, help our nation to grow more closer to that. And uh, thank you again for your love for us and what we get to experience because of you in our life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The weapons of this war, our praise 
July, everybody. I'm Paul, one of the pastors here at The Journey, and I hope you're having a great holiday weekend as we celebrate the, the country that we live in, our Independence Day, the freedoms and opportunities that we have. And uh, we're so blessed to live in the country that we live in, and we're so thankful for those who have fought for our freedoms and for those who continue to fight to forge a more perfect union. You know, it is popular these days to look at our country and see all of its failings and all of its difficulties and challenges, to look back at our past leaders and see all of their failings as well. And yet we live in a country that still today, um, so many places around the world look to the United States as a beacon of hope, a city on a hill. They look to, to us as a opportunity for uh, democracy to continue to spread and we're, we're thankful for the country we live in in spite of all of the challenges and difficulties that uh, lay before us. You know, you may or may not remember Patrick Henry from your American textbooks. He was part of the Virginia Congress. He was a lawyer. He also then went on to be a representative with the Continental Congress. And in March of 1775, he gave his most famous speech as as Britain and the colonies were uh, having more and more tension and as compromise seemed to be vanishing, Patrick Henry stood before the Continental Congress and he said these words as part of his speech. They tell us, sir, that we're weak, unable to cope with so formidable an adversary. But when shall we be stronger? Will it be next week? Will it be next year? Will it be when we're totally disarmed and when a British guard shall be stationed at every house? Shall we gather strength 
by inaction? Shall we acquire the means of resistance by lying on our backs and hugging the phantom of hope until our enemies have us bound hand and foot? Sir, we're not weak if we make a proper use of those means which the God of nature has placed in our power. Three million people armed in the holy cause of liberty and in such a country as that which we possess are invincible by any force which our enemy can send against us. Besides, sir, we shall not fight our battles alone. There is a just God who presides over the destinies of nations, who will raise up friends to fight our battles with us. The battle, sir, is not to the strong alone. It is to the vigilant, the active, the brave. There is no retreat, but in submission and slavery. Our chains are forged. Their clanking can be heard on the plains of Boston. The war is inevitable, and let it come I repeat, sir, let it come. And then he wraps up his speech this way. What is it that gentlemen wish? What would they have? Is life so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it, almighty God. I know not what other course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. Now we typically remember that last line, right? Give me liberty or give me death. Give me freedom or I'll die trying. His speech is inspiring and it inspired the Congress to, to rise up, to take up arms and to be prepared for the fight for independence. And within a month, the, few, the first few skirmishes of the Revolutionary War broke out. You know, as much as we love our country and are grateful for it, um, are inspired by those who pledge their allegiance to our country in the way that Patrick Henry did and so many others before him, uh, we can run the danger of our allegiance being in the wrong thing. Uh, we run the danger of celebrating one freedom over an even greater freedom. If you're somebody who's a follower of Jesus, our allegiance is first and foremost to him. It's to Jesus and it's to his kingdom. In the book of Philippians, in the New Testament of the Bible, Paul, who wrote a lot of the New Testament, he was writing to the church at Philippi, and he talked about this allegiance. He talked about this exact thing. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 17 through 19, we read these words. He says, Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. And just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For... As I have often told you before and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their, their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach and, they, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. Paul writes to the church at Philippi and he says, guys, follow our example. Follow the example of others who are trying to follow after Jesus and he says, listen, I, I, I've told you before, I'm telling you again, even with tears as I write this, you can feel the passion in him. As he says, when you look around you at the world around you, there are so many who are living antithetical to the cross of Jesus, so many who are moving in the opposite direction. And it's going to lead to their destruction. Their God is their stomach. It's all about instant gratification and me, 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 me. Like all of my freedom to do whatever I want to do. So American, right? And so we're living in this place. He says even that their glory is in their shame. In other words, they're prideful about the things that they should be ashamed of. He says their mind is set on earthly things. Their mind is focused just on the here and now. And you hear his concern. And you hear what he's saying is, in essence... They have the wrong allegiance. Their allegiance is on the wrong thing. And then in Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, the very next verse, he says this, But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, as a follower of Jesus, your ultimate allegiance is to Jesus. It's to his kingdom. It's to the kingdom of God and his priorities. You know, in any kingdom... A king or a queen is at the head of that kingdom, is, is on the throne. And the subjects, they pledge allegiance 
to the king, to the queen. They, they bow to the throne of the king or the queen. But Jesus is our king. You know, in Philippi, they were under the, the dome of kind of Roman oppression and in the Roman world. And in the Roman world, Caesar, he was who you pledged allegiance to. He was actually seen as a son of God, like one of the gods. And so people had to pay homage to him. And yet now these new followers of Jesus in Philippi, they realize that Jesus is their ultimate king, that his kingdom is the one that really matters, and it put them at odds with the Roman Empire. They faced a significant challenge and persecution because they were refusing to pledge allegiance to Caesar as one of the sons of God. They knew that Jesus was the Christ, the son of God. Now, it doesn't mean because our allegiance is first and foremost to Jesus that we can't celebrate our country, that we can't pledge allegiance to the flag or sing our national anthem. Of course we can. We, we live in two worlds. We really have dual citizenship, right? Citizenship in this world, in this country that we live in, but then this ultimate citizenship in heaven. But I think the danger that we run into in America is that we, because of our prosperity, because of the great country that we live in, we can see America as the reason why we have blessing and freedom and peace. But it's not the United States that has given us that. It is God. Right? God is the one who brings us peace. God is the one who brings us freedom. God is the one who blesses us. Maybe one of the ways he does that is through the country that we live in, but God is ultimately the one that gives us all of that. He's the one that brings us freedom. Anything beautiful in our land comes from him. And anything that we experience in this country, it just gives us glimpses, echoes of a greater freedom, of a greater thing from God. You know, freedom in America is kind of one of our core values, right? It's, it, it's, um, it's in everything that we see and do in the United States. Uh, the freedom of the press, the freedom of speech, the freedom of religion, freedom of assembly. But there's a, a better and, and richer freedom. Paul, in the book of Galatians, as he wrote to the church of Galatia, spoke about that. He said this in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. He says Jesus came to set us free. And one of the ways that the Galatians were not living in freedom is that they were getting sucked into religion and all the kosher laws and Sabbath requirements and all these kind of Jewish religious laws. He says don't get sucked back into that. Jesus sets you free to, to live freely in relationship with him. And then in Galatians chapter 5, verse 13 through 15, he says in the message, I'm, I'm going to use the message to paraphrase it. It's a little easier to understand. He says, it is absolutely clear that God has called you to a free life. Just make sure that you don't use this freedom as an excuse to do whatever you want to do and destroy your freedom. Come on now. Like we've, we've all seen people who have done that and maybe, maybe you have too. They had the freedom to do whatever they wanted to do in our good old kind of American way. Like, no one's going to tell me what to do. They were like, I'm, I'm doing it. And they drank and they drank and they drank and they drank and they actually destroyed their freedom. Like they, they blew up a marriage. They lost their job. Listen, some people that we know, maybe, maybe even you, uh, certainly others that we have seen and known and experienced, they lost their freedom and ended up in prison because they thought they had all this freedom. Like, I can do whatever I want to do. And they ended up in jail. Like, we've watched so many people who use their freedom, but they end up destroying their freedom. Paul says, don't, don't do that. Don't have your focus on, like, just whatever I want to get. That's not real freedom. He says, rather, use your freedom to serve one another in love. That's how freedom grows. Like, that's so different, right? Like, Use your freedom to serve and love others. He says, for everything we know about God's word is summed up in a single sentence, love others as you love yourself. That's an act of true freedom. If you bite and ravage each other, watch out. In no time at all, you will be annihilating each other 
And where will your fre- uh, precious freedom be then? Right? Where will your precious freedom be then? And, and we know this, right? Because listen, if you just chase after your freedom and all the things that you just wanted to do, and you don't really care what happens to anybody else, like I'm gonna just go and do whatever I wanna do, but then this person does that, and that person does that, and that person does that, it is only a matter of time until you run into one of those people, right? And all that matters is that you get to do what you want to do, but all that matters to them is that they get to do what they want to do, and ultimately you end up just annihilating one another. That's not freedom. So Paul says to the people in Galatia, use your freedom not to just do whatever you want to do, but instead, Jesus gives you a freedom. A freedom from the law, a freedom from sin, a freedom from earning our way, a freedom from having to depend just fully on ourselves, a freedom from guilt or shame. And we're to use that freedom to serve one another in love. In another translation, it actually says that we're called to live as slaves to one another. We're serving one another in love. And the point is this, that freedom isn't for you alone. It's freedom for the sake of others. Our allegiance and our real freedom comes from God to be used for his purposes, to bring justice, peace, hope, and freedom to others. You know, as great as this nation is, one day it will be no more. But his kingdom will go on for eternity and will experience real freedom forever. Patrick Henry said, give me liberty or give me death. Give me freedom or I'll die trying. And we love that passion Right, that allegiance to country. Um, Over the last several months, our staff team has been watching, about once a month, watching a message series from a guy named Kyle Eideman. He's a pastor at Southeast Christian Church in Louisville, Kentucky. And in one of the last messages, he shared the story of a famous missionary named Adoniram and Ann Judson. Uh, Adoniram was born in 1788, 13 years after Patrick Henry's famous speech. And Adoniram and Anne Judson, um, their story, Adoniram's is one of starting to find and follow Jesus and to walk with him, to take steps to to follow him. And that led him, actually, to feel called to Burma. Burma is what is now modern-day Myanmar. And if you've seen the news over the last year, uh, Myanmar is an incredibly uh, difficult place to live and to be. The, the military has actually been shooting their own people, and it's a challenging environment. Well, it was certainly a challenging environment in the early 1800s when Adoniram went to go to Burma. It was a new language. It was an incredibly difficult climate. It was a, a country with new diseases and challenges. It, it was a place where he was not FaceTiming back with his family. You're like, once you went, you went, right? Actually, they called missionaries at that time one-way missionaries because they would get on a ship and travel for day after day after day to get to the land that they went, and they knew that they were never coming back home again. Matter of fact, a lot of those missionaries, including Adoniram, would pack up their belongings and put them in a coffin that they would take with them, knowing that they were going to be buried there. Well, Adoniram, before he went to Burma, he met and fell in love with Anne. They were both about 23, 24 years old, and two weeks before they set sail for Burma, they got married. In a now um, fairly famous letter, uh, Adoniram Judson wrote to his future father-in-law and asked for Anne's hand in marriage. And as he writes this letter, uh, it feels a little bit like, like a Patrick Henry kind of moment. Um, an all-in kind of moment, like, I'm going this way, and this is what freedom is calling me to, and give me freedom or give me death. This is what he says to his future father-in-law. He says, I have now to ask whether you can consent to part with your daughter early next spring to see her no more in this world. Like, can you imagine writing that? Or can you imagine as a dad, like, getting that with your daughter, you know, asking for your daughter's hand in marriage? He says, like, can you consent to passing her on to me and you will never see her again? But this is what he writes. He says, whether you can consent to her departure to a heathen land and her subjection to the hardships of suffering 
of a missionary life. Whether you can consent to her exposure to the dangers of the ocean, to the fatal influence of the southern climate of India, to every kind of want and distress, to degradation, insult, persecution, and perhaps a violent death. <laughs> can you consent to all this for the sake of him who left his heavenly home and died for her and for you, for the sake of perishing souls and the glory of God? Can you consent to all this in the hope of soon meeting your daughter in the world of glory with a crown of righteousness? Um, Adoniram's dad it is uh, purported that he, his response was simply, she can make up her own mind. <laughs> uh, and it was probably a good decision, and, and she did. And they set sail for Burma, and life was hard. Adoniram ended up being jailed in Burma, uh, and he, in his jail cell, began to try to really learn the language and translate the language. His wife, Anne, she had gotten pregnant before, and he was jailed, and uh, she had the baby, but Anne was very sick. She wasn't able to feed the baby. Her milk had dried up, and so she would travel every day to the jail, and Adoniram had developed a relationship with the, the jail um, owner, or the person that was kind of there protecting him and watching over him. And, and because of that, the the jailer would let Adoniram out at night. He would take the, their baby and he would go to villagers who had had babies recently and ask if they would also nurse his baby so it could live. Adoniram's wife, Anne, eventually died. Um, they had a number of their children die. He had a second wife. She died. Um, six out of 13 children that he had uh, between those two marriages died there in Burma. He translated, um, learned the language, and translated the whole Bible into the Burmese language. He started a couple churches. He had some people come to find and follow Jesus. And then he died. And I wonder if there was ever a moment um, at some point in his life, towards the end of his life, where he had wondered, was this worth it? <laughs> was it worth it? Did this dying to others, this self-sacrifice, this serving others in love, being a slave to others, like it talked about in Philippians, was it, was it worth it? Today, there's about 4,000 churches in Burma that trace their roots to Adoniram and Ann Judson. They estimate about 2.5 million people found hope and healing and freedom in Jesus because of the Judsons. Two and a half million people who experienced salvation and freedom. Two and a half million people who will celebrate with Adoniram, Anne, and their children in heaven. Two and a half million people. Give me liberty or give me death. Henry said it, and it stirred a nation towards independence. And Anne and Adoniram Judson said it with their lives as well. Give me freedom and others freedom and we'll die if we have to for it. They pledged their allegiance to Jesus and in that freedom they became slaves to others, they, to, to love others, to serve others. Listen, we, we celebrate this weekend and rightly so the independence and the freedom that we have in this country. We pledge allegiance to our flag but let's also pledge allegiance once again to this other kingdom and to Jesus, our King, and use our freedom for what will truly last. Adoniram and Ad Judson, they gave their lives freely for the sake of others and their freedom. And this is, honestly, this is what Jesus calls us to. This is what, what Paul talked to the Philippian church about and to the Galatian church about, that we have this freedom, but don't just use it for yourself. Ultimately, that'll destroy freedom. Instead, in freedom in Jesus, we can live freely to love others, to experience peace even when life isn't peaceful, to bring hope to others and not worry about, well, I got to make sure that I get what I want. The God is our provider. He's our protector. And we have the opportunity to bring freedom to others. We pledge allegiance to Jesus the one who brings ultimate freedom to us and to others. And, and like Adoniram and Ad Judson, let us be willing to live freely, to serve others wherever 
that might take us across the street or even around the world. Let's pray together. God, would you help us to live with the freedom that you give us? The freedom not just for ourselves, but the freedom for others. That others might experience your hope, your life, your joy, your peace. That we'd be willing to pledge our allegiance to you wherever that might take us. God, we thank you for the country that we live in. We thank you for those who have fought for our freedoms, for the opportunities that we have in this land because of that. But God, may we, may we never lose sight of where our true allegiance ultimately must lie first. And may we live in the freedom that you offer to us for the freedom of others. In Jesus' name, amen. Paul, thanks for sharing that message with us today. And let's all be taking steps this week to, to meet more committed and taking steps to be more committed in our relationship with him. And be sure to check out the first and next step options that you'll find in our description. And then check out the connect card on the blog if you ever have any questions or we can assist you in any way. Well, we'll hope to see you online throughout this next week and back here next Sunday. Between now and then, let's keep following Jesus, spreading kindness, sharing hope, and remember, we are better together.